So I guess this unfriendly golf weather maybe brought some of you here. But for whatever reason you're here, I'm glad of it. And I hope we can share some information that will be interesting and valuable to you. There's some sign-up sheets floating around. And if you'd like to put your name and email address on that, I will email you a copy of this presentation uh, later today or tomorrow. I want to start out by showing you my website. And the reason I'm starting out with that is because I always forget to do it at the end. And a friend of mine recently told me that my website was really boring. And I said, well, can you jazz it up? And he said, yeah, I definitely can. And let me show you what he did. The audio is not working from the site, but he really jazzed it up with a lot of information there, and you might find it useful. It's easy enough to find. It's at johnpatrick.com, and it has news, interviews that I've conducted or been conducted by with uh, various people. You can see Mar Maria Bartiromo here in a, in a second. It has all my books. Everything I've ever said or done, almost 2,000 blog posts. Uh, so there's a lot there if you get a chance at some point to take a look at it. OK, now, let me get rid of that. OK. Uh, I'm going to concentrate this year on two topics, AI and Bitcoin, or blockchain in, in general. And in the past, I've covered a lot of topics. I'm going to provide a, a very brief update on some of the other topics. But the focus is going to be AI and Bitcoin. And we'll have plenty of time for q and A. I'm going to show you now two short videos that might entertain you or might scare the heck out of you. First, I'm going to show you a robot that's in action and take a look at their uh, body parts, their knees, their ankles, how they're able to maneuver themselves. They're quite amazing. Pretty amazing stuff there. This is a company called Boston Dynamics. It was started by a professor at MIT quite a few years ago. And he knows more about ankles and joints and knees and hips probably than anybody in the world. And he's developed this company. It's been bought and sold. Google owned it at one point in time. Today, I believe it's owned by Hyundai. And you can see the potential there from a dexterity point of view. But now I'm going to show you a different robot that doesn't have any legs. It just sits there, but it's very intelligent. And this is the part you got to really pay attention to and think what's going on here. It's 
not the one I want. So, how do you think you did? I, I think I did pretty well. The apple found its new owner, the trash is gone, and the table where it's right where it belongs. I agree. Thanks, everyone. You're welcome. If there's anything else you need help with, just let me know. dexterity, but more importantly, you saw a, a mind, open mind, open AI was the company that produced that. The Rocket Equation, it's a beautiful thing. thinking and was having an intelligent conversation with a human being. This is just the beginning of what's to come. Now you might think of if you combine the two, the dexterity of the first robot you saw plus the intelligence of this robot, and if you throw in some weaponry in their hands, just imagine how some things that we see in science fiction movies could actually possibly come true. So there's a scary aspect to this, but what I find quite a marvel is the progress that's been made, and it's being, it's happening much, much faster than before. Now here's a picture of the, the president of Tesla and the president of General Motors holding hands walking down the street. Elon Musk said he wouldn't be caught dead in that jacket. Mrs. Barra is a happily married executive. This was created with artificial intelligence. I tried to count the number of fingers there that they're <laughs> in their hands holding each other. I'm not sure if it's 10 or not, but this is the thing we need to worry about and we need some regulation for more on that to come. So in March of 2023, a year ago, I signed a letter that was written by Elon Musk and the co-founder of Apple Computer. And this letter was a plea to put a pause on the development of AI. It's going too fast, this letter said. We're approaching danger 
here if we don't find a way to slow this down. So we beg and plead for a pause. Well, I signed that letter along with many computer scientists around the world, but guess what? Everybody thought it was a joke. Can you imagine Google and Microsoft? They don't even know the, the meaning of the word pause. In fact, they, after this, they accelerated because it was so clear that there was a war at hand between big technology companies and who was going to be the leader in artificial intelligence. December 16th, 1994, I was at a meeting with Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the World Wide Web. He and I and three or four other people uh, at MIT co-founded the World Wide Web Consortium. And the purpose of this was to develop standards that would enable the web to show not just text documents, but to show color and graphics and tabular information and audio and video and all the things we now take for granted, all of which was not possible back in 1994. And as I was sitting there in that meeting, I thought, you know, this is, this is going to change the world. This is the biggest thing I've ever contemplated. It's the World Wide Web. And then, shortly after that, I was at a conference in Phoenix, Arizona, and John Gage, who was the chief scientist at Sony Microsystems, gave a presentation about the web from his laptop. And he showed a classroom in Japan of third graders. And this was live. Nobody in that room had ever seen the World Wide Web, had never seen live video taking place in a far, far away location and being rendered on that laptop and on the big screen in that conference. And I thought, wow, this really is the next really big thing. I couldn't wait to get back to Armont, New York, where I was headquartered, and I wrote a paper called Get Connected. And this paper, it still hangs around the web. And it was a, a short paper that gave executives the tips on how can you take advantage of the internet. And the thesis, of course, was you got to do something. Get connected. Get your customers connected. Get your suppliers connected. Get your employees connected. And use this web technology. Believe it or not, at that time, there was a tremendous amount of skepticism. I'll never forget giving a presentation at a bank in New York City to the CEO and the board of a major bank. And at the end of the presentation, the CEO said, John, that was a very interesting presentation. I appreciate your enthusiasm, but I want to be very clear. We will never connect this bank to the internet. And that shows you what it was like back then. And it was true. And companies, including IBM, viewed the internet as a threat because IBM had a, a billion dollar proprietary software business that was an alternative to the internet. And of course, all of that changed. Then in 2019, I wrote a book called The Robot Attitude. It's part of my six book series, the Attitude Series. It's called How Robots and Artificial Intelligence Will Make Our Lives Better. And just recently, that book has started getting a lot more attention because of the artificial intelligence part of the book where I outline what are the positive things about artificial intelligence. How can it help in healthcare, for example? And that was the beginning of the increase in interest in AI. AI's been around for 50 years. There's nothing new. But there are some things that cause this exponential growth, this frenzy, which just really started mostly last year. And these are the reasons why that happened. First is the awesome amount of computer power made available, not possible before. And one company made this happen, NVIDIA, currently worth $2.3 trillion if you follow the stock market. They have a lot of competition now, but they clearly are in the lead. And this awesome computer power made it possible to calculate trillions of times, whereas before it was maybe hundreds or thousands of times. Secondly, the internet has become more reliable. 
and fast. We used to have dial-up internet, which was incredibly unreliable and extremely slow. Now, almost everybody has pretty fast internet service, and if you want it, you can easily get a billion bits per second service. And we have a third factor, which is cloud storage. Where are we going to put all this data that we're going to accumulate for AI? This is a picture of a data center. You know, all these warehouses you see, you drive down any interstate, there's thousands of them, thousands of these warehouses, and they're still under construction. Many of them, certainly not all of them, but many of them look like this inside. It's dark, blinking lights, storage of trillions and trillions of characters of information, and virtually infinite. And then we have super smart computer scientists. The kids graduating from Carnegie Mellon and MIT and Stanford and Princeton and other great universities, what do they want to work on when they graduate? AI. Are they going to wait until they graduate? Many of them won't. In fact, one venture capitalist is paying students $100,000 if they quit college and come work on AI right now. And so we've got really smart people working in this area. And they are causing breakthroughs in algorithms. These are the formulas, the algorithms. These are the things that make AI work. And following up with this is venture capital. Estimates are that there are around 8,000 AI startups. Every startup today, if it's not 100% AI, they at least, at least say they use AI, or they're AI-centric, or they're AI-oriented. And they're attracting billions of dollars investment capital right now. The market potential for AI, I don't think anybody really knows. Some of the estimates show it to be as high as one and a half trillion dollars. Now, there are many components to AI. It's not just AI. It's a lot of things. This is a partial list. Large language models we're going to talk a little bit more about. Machine learning, which is a capability, computer science capability, that allows huge amounts of data to be understood, whereas before it was just there, but it wasn't really very well understood. And then deep learning, which is a variation on that. Neural networks is an approach to that that simulates basically how the human mind works. That's the neural part. And then there's natural language processing, where now computers can not only understand words that are spoken, but it knows what they mean. Not just the, what the words are, but what those words mean. Robotic process automation. This is not a physical thing, this is software that applies robotic techniques to paperwork. And some estimate that this could eliminate millions of jobs around the world. Uh, robotics, of course, self-driving cars. Elon Musk makes a lot of claims. One of his claims is that Tesla is the largest AI company in the world. And they're building robots. And these robots, he claims will provide more revenue for the company than the cars. These are humanoid robots. They look and act and think like humans. And there's going to be millions of them. And then there are virtual assistants. And these are things that we see every day or maybe use every day, Alexa, Siri on the watch or phone, chatbots, chat GPT. There are many variations on this. So, this page is just designed to show you that AI isn't one thing, it's a lot of things. Now, I'd like to focus a little bit on the pluses and minuses of AI. There are a lot of both. Pluses, robots with AI can do jobs which are difficult, dangerous, or boring. So we saw that example of this robot that was interacting with a human and performing tasks but that's not what I mean. I mean, how about Fukushima, which had a tremendously disastrous nuclear accident and required continuous monitoring for years. No human would want to go into that plant and monitor what's going on. Robots don't mind at all. What about the, Ch the Great Wall of China? It's getting pretty old. It's thousands of years old. 
and there are stones, rocks in the side of that tremendous wall that are beginning to get loose, some of them are falling out. How do you evaluate this? That's not a very easy job for humans, but a robotic drone can fly right up to that particular rock or stone, take a close look at it from various dimensions, and compare the condition of that stone or rock with millions of other stones or rocks that it has seen in the past. Healthcare is a big target of AI, and I'm gonna have some more to say about that. Collaboration is a key thing. This is not just about eliminating jobs. This is enabling humans to learn with their assistant, as some Microsoft likes to call their AI, the co-pilot or assistant. And lastly, I would say it definitely boosts productivity and efficiency. Now, I'm gonna show you a trivial example just to make the point. I don't know if you can read this or not, but uh, this is something I submitted to one of the chatbots. I was sitting on the, down in Tuscany on the eighth floor, I was sitting there watching the ocean, and I was thinking to myself, how far is it from here to the horizon? And I wondered about that maybe 10 years ago, and I found a way to calculate it. Uh, it took a long time for me to figure that out. I asked this chatbot, Gemini is the one that I use mostly. And Gemini almost instantly came back with, oh, no problem, here's how you do that, and here's the answer, 2.9 miles. So now that's a simple example, but it shows you the productivity. I could do it in an hour, AI could do it in a couple of seconds. And when you think about the jobs in the world that are trivial, think about paralegals. What does a paralegal actually do? Well, not to demean them, they're wonderful people, uh, but basically they move documents around from one place to another. They cut and paste, copy, and move things around. That's what they do. Does it require a human to do that? Definitely not. So there are many, many opportunities to improve productivity and collaborate with AI. Now, minuses, there's a really long list of minuses. Mistakes, they actually make mistakes. And so you can't take for granted that when you ask one of the chatbots a question that it's gonna be correct. It may not be correct. And I've run into this quite a few times. When I challenge it, say, are you sure about that? That doesn't seem right to me. I thought da 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 and it comes back and says, oh, I'm sorry, I apologize, you're right. I didn't have the right, I didn't give you the right information. Here's the right information. So you really have to be careful. Bias, well, how is AI created? Who creates that software? Well, eventually robots will create it, but for now, humans create it. Humans are biased. All of us are biased in some way. And some, some of that bias is not very nice. It can spread misinformation. Deep fakes, like the picture you saw of Elon Musk and Mary Barra. Elections and general politics, that's a big target. And they're all working on it. And you can see some, some incredible big examples of this, where they take the video of a person typically a well-known person, and they find some flaw in that person's talk, and they amplify it. And President Biden has been quite a victim of that, and whether you like him or not, uh, you know, he's, had, he's had a stutter since he was a kid, a child. And sometimes he stutters more than a little bit. This AI rendering Taking that video and modifying it shows him to be just a blithering idiot and stuttering on and on and on and on. And they've done similar things to Trump and to many international leaders. It can eliminate millions of jobs. We should not ignore that. Millions of jobs. And that brings up a lot of questions about, well, if those jobs are eliminated, what do those people do? And it brings up the questions about guaranteed basic income. 
and that has a very uncomfortable feeling to politicians of, of all parties, but it's an issue that has to be confronted. And lastly, it can potentially threaten humanity. And Elon Musk and others, other geniuses, they, they're very concerned about this. And recently, there was a publication that said that there was a one in 10 chance that the robots and AI would eliminate humanity in the, in the near term. And the guy from Google, who was the father of AI at Google, and one of the, the thought leaders in the world, he, he came out right away and he said, no, that, that's not correct. What was just said about a 10% chance. You know, it's more like a 50% chance. So it's something to think about and be worried about. Now, one of the dimensions of AI is facial recognition. January 6th, a lot of people broke into the Capitol. They all had cameras. They all took pictures. One guy sitting in Nancy Pelosi's chair with a cigar, and he's so proud of himself and waving a flag and filming himself. These people are not very hard to catch because they're their faces are also on Facebook and Twitter and other places. And so in a relatively short period of time, uh, authorities were able to arrest more than a thousand of these people and like more than half of them were, uh, have been sentenced and are serving time. So it is a positive in some senses, but a lot of cities worry about facial recognition and especially in the hands of police forces. And a number of cities have, have just plain banned it. Uh, I think that's going too far. You know, if there's a terrorist on the loose and the FBI and CIA, they know this person is on the loose, they know of his intentions, and they know he's in San Francisco, then wouldn't you want the ability to, to identify that person and say he's at the corner of Third and Walnut uh, so I, I think they've gone too far. Right now, Airbnb, which has 7.7 .7 million listings around the world right now, uh, has banned cameras. So if you go to stay at an Airbnb rental property, you don't have to worry about being spied on by the owner of that property. So in a nutshell, AI is all about data and algorithms. Unprecedented unprecedented amounts of data that in the recent past we would not even think for a second that we could handle that kind of data. But now, based on the capabilities I mentioned earlier, it is possible to, to, to gather this data, store this data, and apply algorithms to it to actually understand the data. And this is done through a number of different tools, one of which is called large language models. And this is what is used for the generative AI. Large language models have been created that include the entire World Wide Web. Everything on the internet, everything is captured and stored and processed with these NVIDIA processors using various algorithms to make sense of it. Now, you can only imagine that all that data of all the entire contents of the web, we know there's some things out there that are not true. They're just not true. There's a lot of bad stuff out there. There also is a lot of good stuff, but it's copyrighted. So who gives this large language model the authority to provide feedback and answers to questions based on data that it doesn't own. It's owned by the New York Times, for example. By the way, the New York Times has sued the OpenAI company and others, including Microsoft. So this is a, a really big deal, but there's great potential, as I'm gonna speak in a moment. The key thing when you use these tools is conversation. So if you, Use a chat, chat bot, let's say chat GPT or Gemini, as I said, is the one I use mostly. I find it easier to use than the others, but there are now more than a few. There are 
a large number of these chatbots. And they've created large language models and they can answer your question. Or they can generate content. A friend of mine in Connecticut was putting together a proposal to convert a hotel which had gone bankrupt into rental properties and a technology center for people that want to learn how to use 3D printers and how to create new things. It's an innovation center, a really a terrific idea. He sent me an email one day and he said, you know, we're going to have a meeting. Uh, the mayor's going to be there and the city council and they're going to be taking a position on this. Would you mind giving your support to it? You live close to where that center is, is going to be, and they know you, and so we'd really appreciate it if you would put something together that covers the things we plan to do, including A, B, and C. So I went to my Gemini bot, and I said, could you please write a letter of recommendation to the mayor for opening up of this innovation center, which has plans to do A, B, and C. And almost instantly it came back with a perfectly well-written letter of recommendation. Dear Mayor started out. And it listed this in a much more formal way uh, than perhaps I would have done. So now, what is the impact of all this? Well, I would say very simply, every organization, every person, and every process will be impacted. Not some of us, all of us. The big revolution is happening in healthcare. It's happening in every industry, but healthcare is of great interest to me. And so I've been focusing on it. Peter Lee at Microsoft and some others wrote this book called The AI Revolution in Medicine. It's a great, great book. And when I finished reading that book, I started to think about some of the data that we have in the hospital network where I'm involved in Connecticut. The electronic health record gets things added to it every time anything happens. If your temperature is taken, or you're given a pill, or you get an x-ray, everything that happens to you is captured into the electronic health record. Massive amounts of data are accumulated over time. What do they do with that data? Unfortunately, not, not too much. Lawyers do. They use it for suits. But otherwise, it, its potential is not really being taken advantage of. And then there's WES. This is the whole exome sequencing. Now, I'm sure you've heard of the genomic sequencing of the human being. The exome is a portion of the genome of the human. The difference is that the exome only includes those genes which are protein coding genes. In other words, they tell the body how to produce the proteins which make up all the things that our body needs to be able to do. That data is being collected now at some hospitals, not, not too many, but more and more. In Pennsylvania, the hospital network there, they sequence the genome, the, the exome, of every patient that walks in the door. You could come in with a sore foot and go to the ER, and you're going to get your exome scanned. They anonymize the data, and they put it in a database. What are they going to do with that database? Well, they don't know, but they're saving it. Because now, with AI, they can do something with it. And so when you think of cancer treatment, for example, the traditional way of treating cancer is to say, well, if it's breast cancer, take this drug. If it's prostate cancer, take this other drug. If it's this cancer, and so on. Well, that's, that's yesterday. Now, the tumor cancer tumor is sequenced, and all those genes are analyzed to find well, what gene is it that went bad here, and then what drugs, what chemicals, basically, can adjust that gene, can change it, fix it. And so it might be that you have 
cancer of the ear, but the drug for the foot might be a better application for that particular tumor of that particular person. So tremendous potential here. Medical errors, Johns Hopkins did a study, it's very controversial, but it showed that the number three cause of death in America, number one being cardiac, number two being cancer, number three being hospitals, and due to medical errors. And I don't know if that's the right number or not, but I, I know that there are a lot of deaths caused by mistakes that are made in the hospital. Most of them medication errors. And medications, you know, there's so many thousands of medications today, some of them are five, six syllables long, and some medications that are that long sound just almost the same as another medication that's similar sounding, looking. One has a maximum dosage of 100 milligrams. The other has a maximum dosage of 100 micrograms. That drug is given to an infant who dies. This happens. AI can definitely fix that because it can look at every aspect of that medication and the health of the patient before that medication is given. Medical research is has been booming for a very long time, but I expect it to accelerate greatly now. There are many medical uh, bio startups that are focused on uh, creating new drugs based on what they can learn from AI. Diagnoses are going to happen more accurately uh, and faster. Physician notes. Some say that the average physician spends two hours every day writing physician notes for their encounters with patients during the day. This is time not spent at the office, this is time away from their families at home. And could there be another approach to this? Well, absolutely there can be, there it is. There's a startup in New York that was started by a cardiologist from Carnegie Mellon. And he developed this technique whereby they use AI in the following way. When you go to see the doctor, the iPhone is laying on the table, the doctor says, do you mind if I record our conversation? Sure, go ahead. So that conversation is recorded, it's given to the AI, the AI writes the position notes. AI puts the data from that encounter into the electronic health record. Number three, AI sends a letter, it creates a letter for the patient saying, hope you had a good meeting today with Dr. Smith. Smith, here's the, what you talked about, here's what was recommended. Let us know if you have any questions. So there's tremendous gains to be had there. And physician burnout, by the way, is, is a very real thing that we should worry about. Uh, stethoscopes. Stethoscopes have been around since the 1800s, and there's so much that could be done to make this more effective. There's a company in San Francisco, a medical startup called Echo Health, E-K-O, Echo Health. And they have a stethoscope that looks a little different than the normal one, where that black tube connects into the part that the doctor puts in their ears, you unplug that and you put this extender in there and it captures the same thing, same information that the physician is hearing uh, through per, perhaps a form of auscultation and uh, it converts it from analog, the voice, to digital. That information then can be downloaded to the smartphone and then uploaded to the cloud and compared to millions of other people's data. And one study suggested that a pulmonology resident who is learning how to identify various things, such as these things I've listed here and, and others, uh, they, their experience is limited. But if they use an, one of these echo stethoscopes and apply that information into the cloud and have it and have AI compare it to millions of other people's samples, 
then uh, they can have a diagnosis that's more accurate than what a resident could do. I, I happen to know three or four pulmonologists and they're, they've been doing this for 40 years and they know a lot. They, they listen and they can identify things that many others can, uh, cannot, but they can't necessarily identify everything. And that's where AI comes in. X-rays, CT and PET scans, MRIs, they're just data. They used to be films, now it's data. And once again, this data can be analyzed by AI. Stanford University has been studying this for, for a long time. They'll take uh, mammograms, digital mammograms, they'll two or three hundred of them. They'll give it to a panel of, of radiologists who will do their analysis. They'll also give it to an AI. The AI comes out ahead, more accurate. There are cases in particular in digital mammography where the radiologist just plain can't see certain things that can be present, uh, whereas the AI doesn't look at it that way. It's looking at the data. The opportunities in healthcare, I'd say, way exceed the risks. There are risks, for sure. And I prefer to think of it in a positive way. This is a chance for healthcare to catch up. Healthcare is behind, way behind. Uh, where other industries are. So this is a great, great opportunity. What I have advised the hospital here in town, I've been helped as well as New Dance Health up in Connecticut, is don't try to solve the world. Don't try to reinvent all the medications you're using. Think simple. Go for the low-hanging fruit. Look at the paper-based processes that you have throughout your organization that can be eliminated. And every hospital that I know of is way short of staffs, staffing. So if they can eliminate unnecessary paper-based things with AI, that could be a big help. Surrounding all this, we really need to have some regulation. The Senate started hearings in 2023. They had multiple hearings. One astute senator I call the senator the, uh, not the senator, but the Senate, the, the Senate Assisted Living Home. And one of those senators, senators said, it looks like, sounds like the genie is out of the bottle, was his comment during this hearing. To which I respond, there's going to be more genies coming out of more bottles, so you better get your act together. Europe and China are far ahead. They have been on this for a long time. They have published guidelines, they call them guardrails, to prevent bad things from happening with AI. In the US, we're talking, but no action. Okay, I'm gonna move on to another topic that I know some of you are quite interested in, cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies, first of all, Bitcoin, for example, is not, there's nothing physical. Now, 10 years ago, I bought 50 of these one ounce copper Bitcoin commemorative coins. And I gave them to friends and I gave them to people that came to the tech talk. Some years later, I got a phone call one day in Connecticut from a person I didn't know. And this person said, uh, Mr. Patrick, I'm sorry to bother you, but I noticed uh, this tremendous rise in the price of Bitcoin, and I have one that you gave me some years ago. How can I sell that? <laughs> I said, well, I'm very sorry, sir. That was a commemorative coin. It's one ounce of copper, so whatever an ounce of copper is worth, that's the best you can hope for. And the last I looked, copper was about $4 an ounce. So he was disappointed, needless to say. So there's nothing physical. It operates through the technology called blockchain. There's no central authority. And this is what spooks a lot of people. Well, how do I know this is going to work? Who's in charge? Well, it's, there's nobody in charge. It's done through algorithms. And 
In the U.S., most people would say that scares me. In many other countries, like Venezuela, they say, no central authority? Oh, we love it. And that's why you see what's going on. El Salvador is, is the first country to adopt Bitcoin as, a, as the official currency of the country. Uh, it's secure. This is one of the positive things about Bitcoin on blockchain. And there have been a lot of cases where companies that deal with Bitcoin have become fraudulent, have gone broke, have done a lot of bad things, but the technology itself has not been broken. Transactions on the blockchain, a little more about blockchain in a minute, are immutable. It's my favorite word, immutable. And immutable means that you record it, it's there. You can't unrecord it. If it was wrong, well, you can add another transaction, but you can't change the transaction once it's been stored on a blockchain. And how this all works was written in a paper by Satoshi Nakamoto. And that paper is eight pages long. And when you get your copy of this, you can click on the word paper there and you can read it. If you have any difficulty sleeping, I recommend this. And before you get to page two, you'll be asleep. It is an uninteresting, extraordinarily technical paper. One of the characteristics of Bitcoin is that there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin, ever. And that's because that's what's built into the algorithm that makes all this work. 21 million. How many do we have right now? Uh, about 19.6. When will we get to 21 million? Uh, roughly around 2140. I figure I'll be 195 years old. So we got quite a long way to go with that. Another characteristic of Bitcoin is that there's a process called halving. Halving. Maybe is a better way to enunciate it. Halving happens every 210,000 blocks. And a block consists of multiple transactions, a transfer of Bitcoin, a sale, a purchase, and these blocks are chained together in a blockchain. And every 210,000 blocks, there's a, which is about roughly every four years, there's a halving. And that halving cuts the commission, in a sense, of the people who are out there on the blockchain managing their little part of it. And it's millions of people, and millions of computers around the world, they're all part of the blockchain. They, make, they validate the transactions, and they make sure that everything is working. There are 28,000 cryptocurrencies, so it's not just Bitcoin. 28,000. Most of them are, I would call them, experiments. They're done by computer science students that know that they can do it, so they do it. Some of them elevate to the status of a meme. A meme would, example would be Dogecoin or Shiba Inu. And what does that mean to be a meme? Well, there's a, a, a stock now called DJT, Donald J. Trump. That, I would call it a meme. The stock has skyrocketed, but the company has uh, about $3 million in revenue, $50 million in losses. Would you invest in that? I sure wouldn't. So I would say it's just a meme. Oh, well, I own a, I own a DJT share or two or however many. There are 600 plus exchanges Exchanges where you can buy or sell cryptocurrency. Exchange, think of like Merrill Lynch, Fidelity, or J.P. Morgan, etc. And the digital wallets that are used to store these cryptocurrencies, uh, estimates are hard to come by on this, but the best I can find is it's about a billion. So it's, it's not like an experimental new idea. Now, what about the currency, cryptocurrency part. What about currency? Well, this chart shows you, you probably 
it looks a little hard to read, but the top one is using a digital wallet to buy something. It's about 50%. This is worldwide. Most of, in Asia, it's about 70%. In the US, it's about 30%, but growing. And then you have the other methods there, the credit card and different ways of paying for something. So is Bitcoin a currency or is it a security? Well, you can ask the SEC and you'll get an answer. Ask them the following week, you'll get another answer. And they continue to flip-flop on this question, but for now, it seems to be settled. And Bitcoin is actually both. Now, are people buying things with Bitcoin? Some, but 15,000 merchants which accept Bitcoin are mostly merchants that you never heard of. And it's growing, but for various reasons I'll touch on in a second, uh, it's, that's not the big thing. The big thing is the store of value. Store of value. And an example of store of value would be gold. Well, a lot of analysis has been done comparing Bitcoin to gold, and there's enough for everybody to believe or not believe, but many believe that Bitcoin is a, is a better alternative than gold. And some would say it's starting to look like a safe haven. BlackRock is an example, and, and there are others. Uh, BlackRock is managing trillions of dollars, Larry Fink is a very smart guy. He's a believer in all this. Jamie Dimon is not a believer. Jamie Dimon said recently, if you believe all this stuff, I've got a lakefront, uh, an oceanfront property for sale for you in Arizona. Get that? Oceanfront in Arizona? <laughs> so let's take a look at what is going on with Bitcoin right now as of 8 o'clock this morning. It's 70,642. That's 153% gain from when I was here last year. Not too shabby. Ethereum, which is the second most active cryptocurrency, has doubled in that same time period. So there are 28,000, as I mentioned, there were 23,000 when I was here a year ago. Okay, the market cap, in other words, take all the Bitcoin in circulation times the current price of the Bitcoin, you get $1.39 trillion. The market cap of Ethereum is $430 billion. The market cap of all the crypto is $2.66 trillion. So this is not small stuff here anymore. Uh, last year it was you know, a fraction of this. Bitcoin is 52% of that total. Ethereum is 16% and 31% is for all the rest of the 28,000. So what made this price go up from 27,000 to 70,000? And by the way, some people are saying it's gonna be 150,000 by the end of the year. There are still people that say it's gonna be zero by the end of the year. And there's a few wild people out there that say it might be a million by the end of the year. Nobody knows. BlackRock has accumulated now over $10 billion in their ETF, which the SEC just approved. They've been fighting with the SEC for years, but finally the SEC caved and said, okay, you can do a Bitcoin ETF. Ethereum ETF, no. Just Bitcoin is the only one you can do. And so they started doing it. There's 10 firms, major firms that we've all heard of, that are doing it. BlackRock is the leader. More than $10 billion went into that, that new product, the, the Bitcoin ETF. It's the fastest that any kind of ETF ever reached $10 billion. So that's definitely a major factor, and that was pretty easy to predict. I've been writing about that in my weekly uh, newsletter for, for quite some time. Having is going to occur in April. 
Some people say that's going to cause the Bitcoin price to double. Other people say the Bitcoin price is going to tumble. Nobody knows. I think it, it's likely that it will rise, but who knows? And then the third factor is that there is a limited supply. So unlike the dollar, which the Fed can just crank up the, the speed and create some more, you can't do that with Bitcoin. It's throttled. It's fixed to 21 million maximum. Now there's another kind of crypto that I would say is important, and that's called the stable coin. Stablecoin is not speculative. The stablecoin is tied to the dollar, usually the dollar. There are some that got creative and tied it to an algorithm. Uh, they went bankrupt. But the majority of them tie it to the dollar, or in the case of the spacious euro, they tie it to the, to the euro. Tether is number one at this. and. Uh, Circle, a startup company, I, I know the guy that started it, very smart guy. Uh, they produced the USDC, US Digital Coin. What's the purpose if, it's, if it can't go up and down, if it's tied to the dollar, then what's the purpose? Well, the purpose is to move money from one place to another in a much more efficient way than is possible today. People that work at low-paying jobs often like to send part of their, of their income to their family in South America or other places. How do they do that? Well, they go to Western Union and they pay big fees and they face delays. The fee can be as high as $45. With these stable coins, the fee can be less than a dollar and the transaction happens instantly. So it has a, a purpose. And you might say, well, how do these companies make money on this? Well, they make money by collecting a fee for the storage uh, of the coins. From a consumer perspective, this is a good deal. Now, regulatory speaking, Delaware, as I'm sure you know, is where most companies are, are headquartered although Tesla just moved itself to Texas, but most companies are based in, in Delaware. But for stable coins, Wyoming has stepped up, and they, uh, there's a, a senator there, uh, her name is Loomis, she's a real believer in this, and she wants to make Wyoming be the, the, the Delaware for digital currencies. A little bit more about the blockchain uh, technology. The blockchain technology is, uses open source software. Open source is a really important term. It applies to AI also. And there's a lot of debate about is it good or bad. I remember years ago, Steve Ballmer, who at the time was the number two guy at Microsoft, he was the co-founder of Microsoft. Now he, now he manages and owns sports teams. But you know, he said open source is a cancer. It's going to ruin the software industry. Well, he was wrong big time. And open source has the advantage that it's, it's open. So anybody can look at the software and see how it works. The advantage of that is that if there's a security flaw or something wrong with that software, Somebody's going to see it, and the community at large will fix it. So it's a good thing. The blockchain is a distributed database. There's not one central place. So when a transaction occurs, it's recorded on a blockchain database on somebody's PC or server. Could be on a desktop, could even be on a laptop. But there's thousands of them around the country millions really and they all have this exact same data and it works on a model of consensus so if somebody wants to hijack the whole thing they have to have 51 percent of all the control of all the servers no way would that happen 
So crypto cryptocurrencies is the dominant thing that uses this blockchain technology, but it's not the only thing. Digital artwork, NTX, I'm gonna say just a little bit more about that. But what about things like deeds, cargo airplane titles, birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, things that often get lost. There it's a piece of paper. Sometimes it's next to impossible to, to go back 30 or 40 years and prove that you paid off a mortgage. Uh, why not votes? A vote, in a sense, is an asset. Could votes be stored on the blockchain? Absolutely, they can. DAOs, Distributed Autonomous Organizations. Now we're getting a little further out there. DAOs are very speculative. The concept is that there's no central authority, which of course is true technically, but also the, the organization is based on people scattered around the world who vote on the blockchain as to how they want to proceed what they want the mission of the company to be, are they going to be able to pay a dividend, and various questions. FinTech, financial technology, is tending toward decentralization. Right now, it's all highly centralized through American Express, Morgan Stanley, J.P. Morgan, you know, et cetera. Web3, some people believe that the internet as we know it is going to be replaced by blockchain technology, and this is called Web3. I just read a book about it, and to tell you the truth, I had trouble getting through the book, and I'm not sure I'd buy it. But it's out there, and it's getting billions of venture capital. IBM and other IT vendors are all over blockchain, and they're focused on the supply chain, helping big companies manage their, their goods. One example was uh, IBM and Walmart did a project where lettuce that had a problem, you, you tell the people, hey, we've got a problem with lettuce that was bought between this date and that date, and you know, check it out. Well, if it came from Arizona, well, how do you know if it came from Arizona? So they developed this system that every head of lettuce has a code on it. It can be scanned with a smartphone, and you can tell from that where and when that lettuce was produced. NFTs, non-fungible tokens. So a fungible token is like a dollar. If I give you a dollar, it's a dollar. And you give it to somebody else, it's a dollar. But non-fungible tokens, I give you a Bitcoin, it's not going to be worth the same if you give it to somebody else. So there are many uses for this, but the big thing is art, artwork. There are millions of incredibly creative artists out there, digital artists. They use an Apple iPad with an Apple Pencil, and they create beautiful, incredibly detailed, in some cases automated, animated pieces of art. How do they bring that to the market? It's next to impossible. They don't have the, the brokers and the insiders and the, the connections to be able to do it. But with NFTs, they put it on the blockchain through uh, a, a company which manages the process and they're able to distribute it, sell it, auction it, uh, and make a lot of money. Or go broke one or the other. So NFTs is, I'm not going to go through these. There's a lot of new vocabulary, put it that way. Uh, the, the big players in this are OpenSea and Blur. And these two companies are doing hundreds of millions of dollars of trading in these NFT pieces of art every month. Now, from an investment perspective, Crypto, yeah, it's high volatility, it's high risk. Uh, it, regulation is uncertain. We know we need it, but what's it gonna be? Uh, but if you decide you wanna buy a Bitcoin or $100 worth of Bitcoin, how do you do it? Well, you can go to one of the crypto exchanges. I listed a few of them here. 
Uh, Coinbase is the one with the most notoriety currently. They've come from nowhere into, uh, I think their market cap's around 70 billion now. And you can open an account, you get a digital wallet from them, everything's secure, they authenticate you very closely to make sure you are who you say you are. Uh, and it's an exchange where you can buy, buy and sell. <clears throat> now there's a new way, the spot, they're called spot Bitcoin ETFs like BlackRock, Fidelity, and others are offering. The other big thing in the world of crypto, of course, is Sam Bankman Free. He's, his sentencing is underway at this moment, started at 9.30. I don't know what his sentence is going to be. Maybe if you have your phone, you can look, and it may be in the headlines already. I'm predicting he's going to get 30 years. They've asked, actually, for six and a half years, but the prosecutors want 40 to 50 years. So I don't know, we'll see. There's a long road ahead. There's going to be a lot of movies and books about this story. Uh, and as in so many of these things, the, the lawyers will be the winners. Regulation of crypto? Well, Congress, where are you? Uh, they have some things underway, but not much. Uh, what a shame, because a lot of the innovation going on in crypto is going to move offshore. UK has very favorable regulation now, Canada does. Uh, many parts of Europe and Asia have stepped up to this and made it possible to operate with crypto in a, in a, in a positive way. Bitcoin itself does have some challenges. It's far from perfect. Somehow it got up to $70,000 and seems to have no limit. But there are some limits technically with Bitcoin. The capacity of the blockchain, the speed at which transactions move around, uh, something called forking, which is a technical term. I, I won't go into that. Uh, fees are higher than they were projected to be back at the beginning. There's an important development that I've been following called Lightning Network. And the Lightning Network offers the promise of fees close to zero and lightning fast transactions, near instant transactions at almost zero fee. If that, and it's up and working, but it's not propagated yet. Uh, there are environmental concerns. These miners that operate these servers around the world that make the blockchain work, they use a lot of power, a lot of energy. China kicked them out, and the ones that came to the US uh, were smart enough to move to Texas, or many of them, where there's adequate uh, wind and solar power. Some of them went to Niagara Falls. They take advantage of hydropower. So I think that's a legitimate concern, but I, I think it's going to be, become okay. Uh, Taxes are unclear. The IRS doesn't really understand all this. And they go after high rollers, but to have in place a, a framework for exactly how things work, what's taxable and what's not, like as clear as a bell for stocks and bonds, it's anything but clear as a bell for crypto. And needing a digital wallet, some people don't like the idea of having a digital wallet, and that's a potential impediment. And then there's the issue of, from a currency point of view, merchants, you know, there's 15,000 merchants, how many consumers, and it's a chicken or egg thing. That's going to change, I believe. Okay, I want to just briefly touch on uh, a couple of other topics, and then we'll have q and I'm sure you have a lot of questions. Every year I talk a little bit about mobile voting. And as you know, I wrote a book about this called Internet uh, Attitude. And I'm still a believer. When I wrote that book in 2016, I thought for sure in the 2018 elections it would be used. Uh, no, 
And right now, you see every day, I, I follow this, there are states that say, how can we get rid of voting machines? We want to move more manual hand count only. Well, anybody that looks at a statistics book will tell you that humans don't count very accurately. Machines do, but they don't trust them. And that's a problem. Boats, B-O-A-T-Z, is a startup in Boston that I invested in some years ago. Will they succeed? I don't know, but they just got a contract with Mexico. Mexico has, they believe, 10 million people, Mexican citizens, who are working outside of the state of the country of Mexico. They just signed a contract with votes to provide blockchain voting for people that are outside of Mexico. I just asked them yesterday, how, how many do they expect to use it the first year? And they estimated 200 to 500,000. That's great. That is really great news. So this is gonna happen. I hope I live long enough to see it happen to the degree that it should. There are so many reasons why it makes sense. Millions of people are disenfranchised. And when states like Colorado close voting places and put a sign on the door that say your voting place has now been moved to this other place 50 miles away, the person doesn't have a car, and it just, it, it's highly discriminatory. And people that are uh, disabled in some way, it's very difficult to vote unless you get somebody to help you. When you get somebody to help you, you give up your privacy. So it's, it's not a pretty picture, and there are many, many legitimate reasons why these millions of people don't vote. The metaverse. I've talked about this before, and Facebook has been the leader at this. This is not a new idea, but it's it's starting to catch on because of the introduction by Apple of the Vision Pro. I thought about bringing my Vision Pro here, but I was afraid I might drop it or break it and somebody would ask, well, can I touch it? And, you know, cost $1,000 to repair it. So I, I left it home, but it is amazing. You put this on, and then you watch, for example, Alicia Keys Laboratory here for music rehearsal. I don't know if it's in her home or a separate studio. And it starts to play just like a regular movie and then all of a sudden she's standing right there. And you look over there, what was that? Oh, that's the drummer over in the corner. You look over there, oh, it's the keyboard over there that's accompanying her. And you look up and you see her ceiling. And you look down and you see her floor. And it fills, fills the whole room. It, it's it's mind-boggling to see it. And the potential of this is, is terrific. One ophthalmologist says that she's performed 300 surgeries, virtual surgeries, using this technology before she did her first real uh, operation on a human, human being. So there's a lot going on in, in this, this space. Roblox is a big winner here. If you're not familiar with Roblox, just ask your grandchildren, and they'll tell you that it's one of the essentials in life is to have Roblox. I think I'll uh, pass on that. Who will be the winner? Well, last year I said I think Apple will be the winner, and Apple had nothing at the time. This year they have something which I believe is going to be the, the winner. Just a quick glimpse at healthcare in an area that I'm interested in. This, is, this problem is not getting better. Most doctors I talk to say it's getting worse. The number one problem is cost. There are a lot of problems in healthcare, a lot of finger pointing, but the number one problem is it just plain costs too much. And uh, quality, yeah, there are issues there for sure, as I discussed earlier. But the big thing is inefficiency. These pharmacy benefit managers add, add no value to the equation. It's just like creating a middleman, uh, a wholesaler. You use Amazon Pharmacy 
It's just like buying you know, anything else from Amazon. And you get same day shipping in many locations and it's cheap. And they give you a choice when you get to the cart to check out to say, do you want to use the Amazon Prime price or do you want to use the price offered by your insurance coverage? And in most cases, Amazon's price is lower than the insured cost. How can that be? Well, because there's no middleman. They, you know, the largest, the number one prescribed drug in America is uh, levothyroxine. And that, it's an inexpensive medication, and it's made by Lord Abbott. And I'm sure Amazon went to them and said, we'd like your best price on 5 billion doses of this medication. And so you benefit from that. And so if you buy it with insurance, you pay $10, you buy it without insurance using Amazon Prime, it's $4. So changes are like that are happening, but what a long way to go. Big Pharma, there's a lot of people taking credit for having accomplished tremendous amounts with this. But basically, I would say Big Pharma is still the winner. You know, they say they're going to negotiate the price of drugs. Okay, they've been saying that for years. So that process has started, but it only applies to 10 drugs. Medicare purchases over 5,000 drugs. Why don't they negotiate all the prices? Can you imagine General Motors purchasing department saying, you know, we can only negotiate the price for a handful of the things we use to build a car? So, Big Pharma lobbying is incredibly powerful. They spend billions on TV advertising. You can, it's hard to avoid seeing medication advertisements. And why do we need that? Well, the, the lobby argues, well, it's, people may not be aware. Come on. You know, we have AI chatbots and we have Google and, you know, if I have a sore toe, I Google, what can I do for a sore toe? And that's one of, it's going to give me lots of choices. So that's one of the, the bad parts of, of all this. Uh, I hope it's going to change, but I would like to be more optimistic. My optimism actually is AI is going to change a lot of this. Medical ID, I usually every year go through all the details of how to do this. Uh, I just, this year, will just remind you, please do something with it. Put your medical ID on your phone so that if you get hit by a bus and you're laying in the street and a first responder comes up, they're going to be able to get into your phone and be able to see what medications you're on and who your uh, family members are, etc. Passwords, I've been banging my head against the wall on this topic for all 13 years, I think, that I've been here. And I can only tell you that cybercrime is rampant and getting worse. More spam, more phishing, more fraud of all kinds. And boy, you just really have to be careful. Uh, somebody asked me right at the very beginning here before I started, you know, what's the best password manager? I said in, in early years, one password was the best. And then I, I found that people weren't using it because they found it uh, intimidating, which it can be. And I suggest, well, use Google Password, it's much easier. But I'm gonna flip flop again. One password is the best. And it, it can just, you just have to be patient and learn it. It just takes, it's an investment to make. The essentials behind all of this are two-factor authentication. We're seeing this more and more. This is a good thing. Biometrics is going to be a better thing. Touch ID, face ID. There's a new crypto approach that's being worked on. And pass keys. The pass keys are here, finally, but it's not as easy to use as it's supposed to be, so I'm not pushing too hard for that. I do use it, but know that it's there and keep your eye out for it as more and more websites adopt it. Privacy is a big deal in all these things that we've talked about. It's sorely needed. 
Europe has been on this for a, a long time. Six years ago, they passed GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, and a lot of people didn't like it, but it, it works. And California has done something very similar uh, shortly after, and U.S. Congress, same. I want to comment, I'm almost finished, but I want to comment on what's going on here that I think is really, really significant uh, in the world. SpaceX has reshaped space as an industry. They basically have become a monopoly, and they've launched hundreds of Falcon 9 missions, putting up their own satellites and Air Force satellites and other customer satellites. And they're also putting up Starlink. So while Congress is fiddling around to figure out how much money to give Verizon to string cables under the ground at remote part in remote parts of America, why don't you just forget that and buy them a Starlink dish, put it on the roof, and they get high speed, low latency, outstanding service. I haven't done the arithmetic, but I suspect it's cheaper than what uh, they're doing through subsidies to Verizon and others. Neuralink, you probably read about that this week where another of Elon Musk's companies is putting chips in the human brain. And the potential for this is, is much greater than they uh, seem on the surface. This, this is not science fiction. There are a lot of people who get disabled uh, who can't see because of it, who can't walk, all kinds of uh, problems that there's just, there's just no cure for. But with Neuralink, there is a cure. And they've got one successful case so far, but now they're just going to ramp that up. And that spaceship you see there, that's the Starship. This is going to change the world for our grandchildren. That starship is going to carry, what you're looking at there is 200 feet high. The booster for it is another 200 feet. So there's 400 foot high thing goes into space. And the booster, the bottom 200 feet, comes back and lands back where it started. The first one goes on to the moon, ultimately to Mars and other planets. And it's, it's mind boggling how big it is. So keep your eye out for Starship. Uh, things I'm working on, well, I'm still working on the Attitude book series. Uh, a, a gentleman who's a resident here in Hamilton, uh, Hammock Dunes, not in the club, but uh, he is an authority on energy. So we're, we're talking about maybe energy attitude as part of the, the series. I'm still working with the New Man's Health on digital patient experience. They've just been acquired by Northwell, if you're familiar with hospitals up in that area. So now the combined group is 28 hospitals, and they've got the leverage to, to do some good things. Uh, startups take a lot of my time, and I'm bullish about them, but I know that most of them will fail. So the way I look at it, if you invest in 10 of them, maybe if, you're, if things go right, you'll get one home run and maybe a triple and a couple of doubles and the rest of them fail. But just interacting with them and in some cases uh, helping them uh, is, a, is a great thing. Lego projects. So I urge you to sign up for the Saturday morning fee brief that I send out. It goes out at 6 o'clock every Saturday morning. Just go to johnpatrick.com and you can sign up. And many of you here in the room I know already subscribe, but if you don't, uh, just visit johnpatrick.com. And a copy of this presentation will become available. It's not there now, but it will become available at johnpatrick.com slash techtalk13. Now we move into Q&A. Put in where you at. John, first of all, let me thank you for what you presented. The question I'm going to ask is, looking at the medical issues and the data that exists, I've yet to find a practitioner who looks at the data before you go visit them. 
Very true. You know, one of the biggest impediments to modernizing healthcare is culture. And from medical school through residency into practice, things are done the way they've always been done. And new people coming in helps. But it's going to take a long time if we depend on that. Everybody's got to, got to change. And that requires very strong leadership from the top of the healthcare organizations. So I agree, that's a problem. Yeah, in the back. I didn't quite get everything you said, but data centers? Oh, yeah, data centers use a lot of juice, a lot of electricity. Right. And I'm intrigued with small nuclear reactors because it's a, you know, it's a solution that will provide a steady solar power. Is, is that at all far fetched? Are the data centers? No, not, not at all. No, if you look at the growth in demands for electricity from new data centers and from uh, Bitcoin mining and U.S. manufacturing, which is growing, and you look at the, where that's headed in terms of electricity demand, we, we can't do it. You know, it just cannot be done. Uh, wind power and solar power are, are great, but there's not enough of it. And there's not going to be enough of it in the near to medium term, even though it's growing very rapidly and the price is coming down, it's still it's not enough. So what's the answer? Build more coal-fired power plants? No, the answer is nuclear. And if you look at the, the safety of nuclear power generation, the cost, the, it, there's just a lot of misinformation out there. And a lot of it is at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission which is, consists of a bunch of people that have been there their entire career and they don't trust nuclear. And it's got to change. And the technology now can enable small nuclear uh, producing devices where every data center has its own nuclear power plant. Every country club has its own nuclear power plant. It's definitely should be the future, but that's what this book on talking about uh, is going to be about. If you're interested in learning really what, what, what's going on with nuclear power, read Robert Zub Zubin's book. He's the world's authority on this. And his book is called uh, The Case for Nukes. It's a great book. What else? Yeah, Jim. Yeah, John, I was curious. It's, it's kind of related to the, uh, your impressions on the kick I consulted my 15-year-old grandson, who's my technical expert, and he says he's not on TikTok and not interested in it. And so I lost him, so I want to ask if you could give some comment on it. Now the question's about TikTok, and I'm no fan of Congress, as you might have gotten that impression throughout. And likewise with TikTok, banning it is not the right idea. And what they're missing, what they're not doing, or at least that I know of and can read anywhere, is to apply technology to this problem. And they can apply technology that blockades any information going out of TikTok servers, which must be in the US, but they cannot connect to China. And to provide the algorithm, which China definitely does not want to give up, the algorithm is what makes TikTok successful. And it's what gets kids hooked. And it's not just kids. I have a TikTok account myself, but it's mostly kids. And you know, I would say Congress is just, you know, all of these topics, Congress is asleep. You know, there's there's a few. There are some young, smart, innovative 
people that have worked for startups and, and had some business experience, but they don't get any much of a voice. The voice goes to Maxine Waters, who's 85 years old and chaired the cryptocurrency committee. What does she know about cryptocurrency? So, yeah, I don't think they're approaching it in, in the right way. Yes? So, I'm not sure I got what you're saying. The, the uh, robots and AI. Yeah, but they can. Very popularized big issues now. Yes. Yeah. They really proud that they show off. We did the robotic surgery, this, this, we are successful, and they really also. Now I understand there's there's a trust that needs to be built up. You know, in America we're we're an aging population. <laughs> we all know that. And many of aging people they need a companion. And home health care workers are one of the lowest paid areas of employment in the country. And there's a shortage of them. And so if you look back to that first video, or second video I showed you, imagine that robot sitting on the kitchen counter and interacting with the person and understanding their needs and talking with them, playing games with them, recommending various health uh, things that they need to be addressed. It's, it's out there. There are you can buy robots for home health care, but they're expensive, and most people don't know about it. But that's going to have to be the future. Yeah. Anything else? That's all. You know, John, you said that uh, in ten years we've sold 19 million Bitcoin, and the last two million is going to take a hundred years. Uh, I don't get. I don't get. The well, it's, it started in 2008, and there's an algorithm that controls how many new blocks are created. And since 2008, it's created 19 million, and that's the arithmetic. goes out to 2140 to get the rest of them, the next 2 million. Doesn't seem to make sense. I see your point, but that's that's what it is. I'm going to do some research on that. That's a good question. Yeah, Pat. Yeah, John. Just a comment about the, the dumbing down of humanity caused by artificial intelligence. I don't have to learn how to write a paper anymore. It will write it for me. I don't have to learn how to do math. I don't have to learn soon how to drive a car. And basically, there's going to be a very elite bunch of people who know how to operate in this environment. And what's everybody else to do? Why go to school anymore? It's all done for me. Well, that's, that may be an extreme point of view, but it's certainly headed in that direction. Uh, there are a lot of job openings right now for people in robotics and AI, a lot, millions. And you know, when the internet came about, it was the same concern. The internet's going to eliminate all the jobs. And when I was chairman of the Global Internet Project in 1995, we hired a consultant to do a study on how many jobs have been lost by the internet and how many have been created by the internet. And the net result at that time, this is 1995, was that two million new jobs have been created. So now you look at Amazon and eBay and Facebook, you know, there's millions and millions of people working in internet-related uh, tech companies. And there's still going to be a need for people to do certain things. But long term, yeah, it, it's, it, it's really hard to imagine that 
humans are going to be needed. And you know, the people who are really afraid of all this say that the, the robots are going to look at what humans have done over the long term and observe that humans have eliminated many species, life, species of life over the thousands of years. And they might say to themselves, as they think about it, well, why do we need humans? We know what they did to other species. Maybe they might plan to do that to us. Let's eliminate the humans. And that may seem extreme, but there are people that, that really believe that. Yeah, it's, it's a fair point. But uh, as they say, at least for the short and medium term, there's more jobs being created than there are being eliminated. Okay, well, okay, one more. Uh, John, there's so much being stored in computers and data centers, you know? Aren't you then subject to maybe a cyber attack by cyber war? And if all our data is digitally stored, and if there is either an electricity problem or some rotation, That's a very good point. I mean, security, I didn't talk about security, but it's fundamental to all these things that we discussed. And fortunately, security is getting better, but a lot of companies are not, they're not following the rules, so to speak, because there aren't any rules, because the regulation by the government has been weak. And you know, you hear about these uh, hacks that take place, and almost always they took place because there was a failure of human coordination, where a technical company sends out a fix and say, better update this particular software program, we've got a patch for you. And they oh yeah, okay, we got another patch. And they've got you know, hundreds of software vendors that they're dealing with, and it takes a process and a discipline to follow in, in making sure that everything remains secure. It's possible to be secure. I can tell you that. And some people say, well, no matter what you do, somebody's going to break in. Well, that's not true. If you have a well-secured server, and you follow the right protocols for applying the latest patches, you can be secure. But there's unfortunately a lot of government entities in particular, uh, which say grace over our water and sewer and power uh, utilities, and they don't necessarily follow the, the right protocols. So the government's aware of this, they're working on it, but it's moving pretty slowly. But I, I don't, think the catastrophe that you outlined is very likely. I wouldn't say it's impossible, but unlikely. And the gentleman next to you, you can have the last question. Uh, follow up on this question over here about uh, AI doing a lot of the work for us. Let's say I'm a college student and I have a home paper for it. I would expect a good number of those students to be using AI to do that. How is a professor going to know Well, there's a lot of tools available to teachers and professors that use AI to determine whether that paper submitted was written by AI. <laughs> yeah. And uh, that's been around for a long time to, you know, to avoid plagiarism. But now, since it's so much easier for students to get an AI to write a paper for them, those tools have become even more uh, important. Well, it's a great pleasure to think of all of you. Thank you for your attention.